This episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast is presented by the new movie, American Underdog, the Kurt Warner story. Guys, I saw a preview of this movie, and I'm telling you, this is the movie to go see this holiday season. Take the family and go check out American Underdog. And if you know Kurt Warner, two-time MVP, two-time, three-time Super Bowl participant, won the Super Bowl MVP, and certainly won the Super Bowl in Super Bowl 34 when the Rams beat the Titans. But his story is one of the more improbable, incredible stories that you'd ever imagine in not only reaching the NFL and having an opportunity to put on an NFL uniform, but then to excel and to excel all the way to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which he was inducted in a couple of years ago. This is his story, him and his wife's story, and it's a family film. Like This is a movie you want to take everybody to see. There's nothing... Uh, inappropriate. That's what I love about some of these movies. When you're looking to take your kids and your family to go see, there just isn't a lot of good family films out there with an awesome message. Well, American Underdog is one of those films. And Zachary Levi from the movie Shazam, he plays Kurt Warner and he looks just like him. It's, it's really crazy how much of a spitting image he is of a younger Kurt Warner. So got to see a preview Highly recommend. Go see American Underdog. It's in theaters Christmas Day. You can't miss it. American Underdog. Go see it Christmas Day. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Jason. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast, and we have a great conversation today with Samantha Ricketts. She is the Mississippi State head softball coach, named as the sixth head softball coach for the Bulldogs back in July of 2019. And her first season was the 2020 season, which everybody remembers because it was cut short due to COVID and the pandemic. She actually became the fastest head coach in program history to reach 20 wins, doing so in just 23 games, and is the only coach in Mississippi State history to have her team nationally ranked at some point during her first year. And that 2020 campaign saw her team go 25-3 and and joined the number one UCLA Bruins as the only team in the nation To win 25 games, Mississippi State finished number 20 in the final polls, its highest final ranking in program history. And then this past year, in 2021, her team won 35 games and had a berth in the NCAA regionals. Now, Samantha, before she was a coach, was a player under head coach Patty Gasso at the University of Oklahoma, where she was a two-time All-American and a team captain. And what a story she shares on how she even got to Oklahoma. She was not highly recruited, but she shares a really cool God story that I think can tell you how God kind of directs our steps in certain ways and takes us in a wonderful journey from the Grand Weaver himself. And Samantha lived that out, and now she's coaching at Mississippi State. Take a listen to Samantha Ricketts. She's got a great story, and she joins us here today on Sports Spectrum. Hey, Samantha, welcome to the show. Hey, Jason, thanks for having me. Absolutely, good to see you, good to talk to you. Like I said, you come highly recommended from our friend Sarah. We'll talk about maybe her in a minute and the relationship that you developed with her and so many others during your time in Oklahoma as a player. Uh, Most people who are watching this or listening to this, especially who are interested in softball, as I am, they see softball on the national stage in the spring. And I know there's a lot of work, though, that goes into preparing for a long season. So we're in the fall here. Tell me about what it looks like to be a coach in the fall as you get ready for, you know, next year, I guess. Yeah, the fall is um, really where we get a lot of our work done. And we just started off with team practice this month. Um, When we're outside of team practice, we're still allowed eight hours a week. So really, it's a lot about getting stronger, getting faster, getting better. So they do a lot of work in the weight room. Um, We'll do small group work, whether it's pitching, defense, or hitting. And then we kind of ramp up, get into team, and start introducing a lot of the new players to some of the systems or kind of the way we operate, get them used to the speed at which the college game is going to be played. And then from there, we get to play eight fall contests. Kind of depends. Sometimes we'll play them against junior colleges, 
or some local D1s, just nothing probably too far with the travel in the fall since we're not in season and gives us a chance to kind of see where we stack up and a lot of scrimmaging against our own pitchers as well. And just really trying to fine tune and get us ready so that after Christmas break, when they come back in January, we can hit the ground running and be ready to go by the first week of February. Yeah. Can you imagine if you didn't have the fall, right? To be able to get this in and try to ramp it up in a month, basically, when you come back from Christmas, I have to imagine this is valuable time for you as a coach. It is. It's big on the development. It's probably the most time we get with our players to really break things down. Um, And a big part of our recruiting season as well, where we're still recruiting the next classes of incoming kids. Um, So really juggling a lot right now, but the best, the best time is when we get to be with our team and really kind of dive in and do a lot of the small detailed work with the development. When did you begin to see that coaching was something you wanted to pursue? Because you played, uh, you were with Oklahoma and you had a great career there as a player. And then suddenly this coaching thing kind of, kind of takes shape for you. When did you kind of figure out or start to see that you might want to go into this coaching thing? Yeah, it was really my, um, my sophomore year at OU. You know, I went in to college, not really knowing what my, my path, my career path was going to look like. My mom wanted me to be a nurse. That's what she's done. That's what her family's all done. And so I think I went in pre-nursing just because I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And my sophomore year is when Coach Gasso at Oklahoma kind of pulled me inside and said, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this coaching thing? I think you'd be really good at it. And kind of from then on, it was something that I just started gravitating towards. She really took me under a wing and just started teaching me even then as a player, just little situations or questions. Okay, well, you're looking at it this way. Now, if you were the coach, how would you handle the situation? And just more big picture questions, where as a 20 year old, I was like, I I have no idea if that's your job. But (laughs) um, I think just really kind of started the conversation and really um, kept my interest there. And then from that point on, that was what I wanted to do. And it was just always kind of the plan after that. And I got to stay on for two years as a graduate assistant coach with Coach Gasso. And that was really when, you know, she continued to just teach and teach and teach like she does. And I think that's why you you see the the coaching tree and the success that she's had from her players and former players that have all left, too. Yeah, she's she's a legend. She's been on this show. And I was just so impressed talking to her and understanding um, her real true desire and building culture and building a team, certainly building a winning team, but building Mm -hmm. young women who can go out and make a difference in the world and do great things. And also her faith, which is really important to her. I know it's important to you as well. What are some of the lessons? Mm-hmm. We'll talk about your faith in a second. And maybe this is part of your answer, but what, what are some of the lessons or maybe the greatest lesson that you learned from being around Coach Gasso? Yeah, I think it was not even on the field, but it was about how she treats people and how she is just such a, such a strong leader with her faith, with her family. Um, with her team and how she loves everyone around her and can still push them to be better at the same time. And that is the biggest lesson I've learned from her. It's, it's about getting these young women ready for life after college. And you teach them those lessons on the field and they may be with softball, but it's so much bigger than just the game. And it's helping them grow up and turn into young women with, while they're in your program, because it is such a huge time in their life as developing and becoming an adult. And I think that was the biggest thing. It's just growing young women, growing young girls into women and helping them in that transition piece where they're confident in who they are as a person. They're strong in their faith, in their beliefs, and that they're ready to go out and be successful and also just be str- being strong and not letting someone walk all over them and, you know, being able to hold their own is a big thing that she's, she's very un- unafraid of that. You know, she's not going to back down and she's going to make sure that her players have that same confidence behind them in everything they're doing. So, one thing I was so intrigued by with Coach Gasso was the way that she is very open and incorporates her faith into her coaching, but never forces it on any player. Certainly, you're mm-hmm. recruiting players to have a really good team. You're not recruiting them based on their faith, although it happens to be that a lot of these players either have a faith or come to faith or are at least intrigued by it because of the way Coach Gasso was leading. How have you kind of carried that into the way that you coach as a person of faith, but also as a head coach, knowing that you're not, you know, a coach, you're not hired to be a a pastor, you're hired to be a coach. So how do you kind of incorporate that into the way that you coach? Yeah, I think what I've really learned to do and, you know, starting with from Coach Gasso is just 
surrounding yourself with people around you that are good, strong in their faith, that have the same values and beliefs. And so that you have just good mentors and leaders in place and strong people of faith for your players to look up to. Um, and then bringing in opportunities. I know that was how I was first introduced to Sarah Roberts was she would lead our Sunday chapel uh, before games and they were optional. They were not mandatory. Not everybody went, but you, you got to go and listen to Sarah and her passion for the word and for Jesus. And you couldn't help but be excited about it. So yeah. Sarah, I think was a big part of pulling all of us in and, you know, Sunday chapel became a whole team event because everyone just really loved her and her passion and wanted to start off the week, you know, the Sunday on, on the right foot. And that's something that we've been able to do here. We've got a great FCA program as well. And we started my first year um, when I took over as head coach to do the Sunday chapels and we provide breakfast. And that's probably one of the coolest things I've seen over the last few years is the girls showing up for chapel. Maybe aren't girls who ever, been, they've never been to FCA. They've right. never really expressed interest in going to church, but where there's food, a lot of times they will come <laughs> and they're there early anyways. And they just kind of wander in, they sit down they start asking questions and talking. And it's just such a rewarding experience just to listen to and just really see them start to kind of grow and just even ask questions and be interested in that conversation around their faith and what that looks like. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned your first year coaching it just to happen to be your, you know, first year trying to deal with a pandemic as a coach, just like everybody else going through this. And you guys started amazingly, right? You were what, 25 and three playing extremely well. And then suddenly the season is kind of cut short, just like everything else that happened in this country in 2020. Uh, what was that like for you? Just kind of, I have to imagine it's really tough for someone who's getting their chance to be a head coach and the team's playing so well and you want it for them to have that opportunity and then it's like you having to go to them and say, sorry, we're just not going to be able to play anymore. Yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. It was heartbreaking. And, you know, it wasn't something that any coach had experienced in how to handle a situation. None right. of us had been through that. And I think we were all navigating it together and even talking with coach Gasso or other, you know, our SEC coaches, we had a lot of meetings about it as well. And it was just, it changed daily. And that was something we, you know, we tried our best to keep the players informed, but you know, that meeting we had in left field when I had to break it to them that our season was over was, was really tough. And for the seniors, you know, they thought immediately that their careers were over and just to see that heartbreak and just the, the tears, the feelings of disappointment, it was, it were on all of us. And it was something that I knew I couldn't fix. And um, you know, we kind of had to navigate that uncertain future that we're still doing with COVID and the rules that it came from it. But I think one thing it really brought out was just you know, that lesson that you you tell players all the time, but maybe they don't always understand that this game can be taken from you in a minute. And how how are you going to respond? You know, are you more than softball? Or are you finding your identity in the game? Because it's not always going to be here for you. And mm. it was really that hard lesson that we all try to get them to understand and now we've all experienced together. Right. It's the, it's, it's happening a lot faster for so many than they even realized. And I have to imagine then coming into last year, this past year in 2021, what an appreciation there was to be able to play, even though COVID was still happening. And I'm sure there were rules and, and restrictions and things like that on some level, but what an appreciation I have to imagine even for you as a coach to be able to say, okay, look what we get to do. We got through a whole season here like last year, it was taken away. This year, we get to do this. Yeah, it definitely just brought a new perspective, I think, for all of us. And just, we get to do this. We're thankful. We're so blessed to be out here to do this together. Let's enjoy it. And, you know, that was a lesson that we continued to bring up even through the struggles of the past season. And we had a pretty rough stretch of conference play to start us off where just nothing was going our way. And it was continuing to bring it back to that, like, Hey, we remember what we talked about a year ago when we got canceled, how we weren't going to take one game, one minute for granted, you know, how are we going to respond? And are we going to let one bad week, one, two, two stretches of conference series really defeat us? Yeah. 35 wins and a berth in the NCAA regionals. So it was a good year. I'm sure you would like a little bit more in 2022. We'll have to wait and see how it works out. Samantha Ricketts is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, Mississippi State head softball coach. I do want to ask you about your faith um, and start with your Twitter bio. 
Um, because if you put something on Twitter, it's public. Everybody can see it. And it says Philippians 4, 6 right there on your mm-hmm. Twitter bio. Uh, why that verse? That's just one I think um, I've always been drawn to Philippians, especially, you know, that chapter and just Paul's message. I think it's something for me. It's a good reminder for myself to read back on. And, you know, I hope that for others to see it and maybe they go look it up if it's young recruits looking at my my Twitter page or whatever that might be. But just that no matter what's happening, there's no need for us to worry about anything because ultimately we're not in control of it. But to always, you know, find a reason and there's always something to be thankful for. You know, God is always blessing us in some way, even in the struggles. And, Mm. you know, it's something that I continue to go back to is that verse for myself and, you know, that I hope that others can find and something that they can reach out to and see if maybe they don't have their strong faith yet or they don't have that relationship, but something that they can peek maybe just pique their interest and see a verse and look it up and say, okay, I wonder, wonder what that means. And maybe dive in a little bit to what Paul's saying or um, any part of the, of the Bible there. Let's take a quick break from our conversation here on sports spectrum to tell you again about American underdog. This is a movie you need to go see in theaters. It comes your way Christmas day. So if you're thinking, all right, what am I going to do? Christmas week with the kids home, take them to go see American Underdog. If you love sports, you love faith, you love good, wholesome stories, clean content, right, that you can take the kids to, take the teens to, American Underdog is that movie, and it's the Kurt Warner story. So if you love football and you know about the Rams and Kurt Warner and his improbable run to the NFL, winning Super Bowls, winning MVPs, eventually getting inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame His story is just one of the more incredible ones you'll ever hear. And now it's being made into a movie. You can go see it. It's really a story about Kurt and his wife, Brenda, and their marriage and just coming together and persevering through faith and making sure that they can have a life that's worth living with their their son, Zach, and now a huge family of kids and grandkids. God's doing an amazing thing with Kurt Warner and Brenda Warner, and it really starts with this film. American Underdog, Christmas Day, it's in theaters, go see it, American Underdog. Well, let's talk about your journey, uh, growing up and faith, where does that take shape? Certainly softball, if you're playing at Oklahoma, softball probably dominates a lot of your life as a young person uh, growing up, and certainly when you get into your teen years and high school years. Tell me about Samantha Ricketts, the young Samantha Ricketts. Oh, man. Well, let's see. I grew up... um... And I'm the oldest of four, four children. We're very close in age. Uh, it's four of us within five years. Oh, and wow. We, yeah, very close. We all <laughs> and you're the to, oldest, so that's like me. I, I have am. two younger brothers, so I'm the oldest as well. There's something there about being the oldest, Samantha, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you have to learn those leadership skills early with that. <laughs> very much so. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's myself, my brother, kind of a year gap, and then my two younger sisters. And we all went to school together. We went to um, Catholic school together from kindergarten through high school. And so grew up Catholic in the Catholic church. Uh, really, you know, parents, I thought my, my mom and dad did a great job just really leading us in our values. That's how they grew up as well. Uh, and it really was just a strong family unit and something I think that's really helped shape all four of us. And, but for my faith journey, you know, church was something that we did and religion was a class that we took. It wasn't ever really a choice, I think, until I got on my own in college. It was just, okay, I'm going to go to religion class like I'm going to math class. And we go to church because that's what we have to do before we go to our games on Sunday. Um, And I think really where I started to just kind of understand more big picture about what my faith journey was going to look like was in that recruiting process and to get to Oklahoma. And my journey was a little bit different. I, I wasn't a big recruit. Um, I was actually signed to a smaller school back in California, right down the road from where I grew up. And I was going to stay home. I was going to live at home to save some money and uh, play at this, this smaller school. And that's where, I, that's where I was going. And then about a month before, call, my, uh, before college started, Coach Gasso ended up losing her catcher that was coming in. She didn't make her grades and she needed a catcher at the last minute at the same time, the coach who recruited me left the school I was at. So hmm. now I was kind of in limbo without a coach, 
and without really knowing what my future was going to look like. And she, at the same time, was looking to fill a gap in her recruiting class. Um, I ended up getting a release from the school and I wanted to kind of, you know, maybe reopen the recruiting, see if this new coach was who I wanted to play for. And that's when um, the OU opportunity came up. And I was actually at freshman orientation at this other school. (laughs) And I remember I had to make the decision like, okay, do I want to stay here close to home? I'm very close to my family. Um, You know, I know I'll probably be pretty successful on this team. Or do I want to make a decision that's going to be uncomfortable and push myself and go play for the best and really see what I'm made of? And I remember, you know, my dad really stepped away from the situation, from the decision. He let me make it on my own because he knew what his decision was going to be. He wanted me to stay. He wanted me to be close to home. Mm. And I just remember breaking down and crying, like, what am I going to do? And, you know, I'm at this orientation. I have a friend who comes in to kind of just be there with me. And I think it was the first time that I just, I prayed on my own outside of church. Like, Hey God, I need some help. I need some guidance. I don't know what to do. Yeah. And for me, that's kind of where it started was just like, all right, this is more than just going through the motions with my faith. Like this is, this is something that I need to be able to rely on and something that obviously is important to me, but I really had no idea where to start. Um, you know, ended up after that, I just, I still remember it being under the tree, my friend being there with me, kind of helping me through this and just crying and just, you know, breaking down, praying and coming to the realization that, you know, you're being asked to get outside your comfort zone and you need to do this because it's going to, it's what, it's what God's plan is for you. Not what your plan is that you've had all along that you thought you were going to do. Hmm. Um, so I ended up going out to OU. I signed, committed. I'd never even visited. And made the trip out there the next month, moved into the dorms. And, you know, it's it's the best decision that I've ever made. And just that path that God has guided me down ever since has all been based off of that one kind of moment. And, you know, from there, I was in a class of kids that were girls that were recruited all over the country, top recruits. And then me, who really I had I had Division two offers and the one D1 that I was going to go to back home. Um and it was just like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to prove I belong here. And, wow. you know, I really, I worked hard. I pushed myself. And then at the same time, I, you know, I grew a lot as a player, but even more as a person. And that's where I was introduced to FCA. I had never heard of it in California where I grew up and got to start going, got to meet Sarah and just really learned more about different types of churches outside of the Catholic church. And I remember going into just a non-denominational kind of contemporary Christian church. I'm like, this is like a rock concert. What's going on? <laughs> yes. But it, it was so fun to experience and experience with my teammates and with others that had the same values as I did. And it just, I felt like that's really when my faith really started to grow. And I understood, Hey, this is about a relationship, not just, you know, a, a class that I'd have to take. Um, hmm. And, you know, I think that was really the biggest part of shaping my faith journey was, was that OU and getting there really in the process as well. That's a great, great story. I love that story. I love that journey. Everybody's journey is different, but yours is so unique. Um, How do you think Coach Gasso heard about you or found out about you, especially when you're saying you're not a recruit? Was there a connection? Did she know somebody else? Like, how did that come about? Yeah, well, the the player that the catcher she was supposed to have come in that year uh, was from a junior college in Northern California. And that junior college coach was also my travel coach. Ah, there it is. So that coach was was the connection. And when Coach Castle called her, she said, well, you know, I have this player, I, this catcher. I, I think she's pretty good. And she actually just got out of where the school she was supposed to go to. So she's available. So they came out. She watched me one time and said, we'll take her. Let's go. <laughs> wow. That's such a great story. And it's it makes what I think, uh, you know, how this Grand Weaver, which I've heard a few people refer God to, the Grand Weaver, how he kind of weaves all of our lives in different ways and yours is very clearly that grand weaving because you could have easily taken the road of listening. I'm not saying you don't want to listen to your dad, but listening to dad or whatever, <laughs> or making that decision that he wanted for you staying there. And who knows where you might have ended up. You, I'm not saying you wouldn't be the Mississippi State head softball coach here today, Samantha, but you just don't know when those fork in the road moments yeah. happen where you got to make a decision and then you kind of see God's plan after you look back, right? Yeah, I think... That was a big part of it. And I think just for it being at 18, it was such a 
life-shaping moment for me. And I think like you're saying that Grand Weaver, it's helped me notice those moments more now as I get older and continue on my life journey, career journey, all of it. And I'm much more cognizant of those moments and really making sure that I slow down and that I don't just try to do everything myself and know when to just step back and understand I'm not in control of the situation, of the career change, of the head coaching change, or anything that might come my way. So what does it look like today for you to kind of live out that faith each day as a coach, as a person? What does that look like in terms of devotionals, in terms of time spent with the Lord, in terms of people pouring into you? Because you're a coach pouring into a lot of people every single day. How are you staying fed and kind of living out that faith as a coach today? Yeah, that's where it gets tough. And, you know, when things start to get busy, it's a lot of times it's the first thing to go for coaches. And that's where someone like Sarah, who really wants to be, you know, she told us this week, let me be the one person that pours into you as you guys are pouring into others. And mm-hmm. she leads a, um, just a women's, a female coaches Bible study. Um, usually twice a month, we'll go like about every other month. But that 30, 45 minutes that we get with her in the morning is just, so crucial and we just all feel so fulfilled by it and she has coaches from all over the countries tuning into zoom with her and it's fun to have that network and just those reminders um so that you know that's a big one for me especially being able to have that network outside of just my town and my university um and you know i have great friends from those calls that i still talk to some of them are former teammates of mine and then from there, it's you know, just making sure that even when I do start to get busy, understanding what my priorities are. No, we still need to carve out my time to get in the word. Um, I like to journal. You know, I use uh, typically the Bible app and the verse of the day, and I'll use that to kind of dive in to pick a verse. And then from there, journal what that looks like for me, what I think the meanings of it might be, and then use that to kind of spark my prayer over whether it be my players, my team, my family, um, but that just helps me kind of stay in a routine as well. Like that's something that changes every day and something I know is going to be there that I can use to sit down with and spend 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever I have, whatever it might be, and just try to stay locked in um, you know, to what I know my priorities are. Because I know when I start to feel too busy or tired or I'm exhausted and I just don't have anything else to give, that's usually the first thing that that went was, Oh, well, have you, have I been in the word lately? Have I been doing what I know is a priority? And the answer is usually no. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that I know, you know, I have to really make sure that I'm being cognizant of, because like you're saying, it's very easy to get burned out if I'm not making sure that I'm, you know, filling up my own bucket before I'm trying to pour into those around me. That's right. Um, as we wind down, I got to ask you what the Lord's showing you and teaching you today, because that's a question we ask all of our guests here on Sports Spectrum. When you think about life, he teaches us, I feel like, something new every day, even the text that you got from Sarah today, right? Just kind of reminding you on something, you know, that you're thinking about. But what is God showing you and teaching you in the life that you're in and where he has you, Samantha, right now? Oh, I think the, the current one that God is teaching me is just about leading myself before I can lead others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times when I'm in the word or I'm listening to something like, oh, that applies to this player, to this player, to this player, or to this situation, maybe something with my family. But what I've really kind of learned lately is, no, that message is for you. And that's something that I need to make sure of that I'm taking care of myself and really reflecting first and foremost on what's in my heart and what I'm doing in my life. You know, it's just like as a coach, if I'm asking my players to really be their best on the field and they don't think that I'm reflecting what I'm teaching, then we kind of lose all trust. So I think just that leadership of self and making sure that, you know, I remember that, I think this was actually another Sarah thing, but Sarah was talking with us about leadership earlier as well. And just how Jesus always made sure he took his time away with the Lord before he would come back to lead his followers. And it's if Jesus can find time to step away, why can't we? And yeah. just, you know, she just gets you. She always knows what you need to hear. Yes. Um, but I just think that leadership of self has been a big thing for me and something I've been really locking in on lately and just making sure that I reflect personally for what it looks like in my heart and what Jesus is asking of me before I w- worry about, okay, now how do I pay that forward and move into my players? That's good. 
That's really good. She's Samantha Ricketts, the Mississippi State head softball coach. Samantha, thanks for being here on the show. Really appreciate it, getting to know you, getting to hear your story, and hopefully we'll have you back on again sometime. And thanks to our friend Sarah as well for our introduction. Appreciate you. Thanks for being here on the show. Yes, I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you for having me. And many thanks to Samantha Ricketts for being here today on Sports Spectrum. You can give her a follow on Twitter. As I mentioned, her Twitter bio has Philippians 4, 6 listed right there in the bio. So you can go look that scripture up to see why that's Samantha's life verse in the scripture that she wants everybody to see when they come to her Twitter page. We appreciate Samantha. We hope 2022 is a fabulous season for her and the Mississippi State Bulldogs. And we'll be keeping an eye on Samantha Ricketts and Mississippi State next year. We also thank you for listening as well. Thank you for tuning in. As always, you can check us out at our website, sportspectrum.com. All of our content there is free. You got articles, you got devotionals, podcasts, tons of content, videos, archival content that spans 30 plus years. It's all available at the website, sportspectrum.com, and it's all for free. You need to go check it out sportspectrum.com. Before we say goodbye, make sure you rate and review this podcast and click that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode of Sports Spectrum. We bring Jesus into the sports conversation. And we want you to use Sports Spectrum as a resource to tell someone about faith, about Jesus, about the gospel. That's what we want to be. We want to be a podcast, certainly, that you can listen to and enjoy. But really what we want to do is be a resource with all of our content to be a resource for you to be able to tell someone about Jesus using sports as the tool. Sportspectrum.com, the Sports Spectrum podcast. We just appreciate you checking out the show today. We love you guys and make sure you tune in next time here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. <laughs>